this past week, Nike's online sales rocketed since the company revealed that former San Francisco 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick <clears throat> would be the face of its 30th anniversary Just Do It ad campaign. The ad is narrated by Kaepernick, who himself launched the movement to take a knee during the national anthem before NFL games to protest racial inequality and police brutality. The ad announces, believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. Film director Spike Lee last week called Nike's decision to feature Kaepernick very courageous in the face of relentless criticism by Trump over the NFL protests during the national anthem. Spike Lee went on to say, I think Nike's on the right side of history with this move. Tiger Woods last week called the ad a beautiful spot. And he told ESPN, I think Nike is trying to get out ahead of it and trying to do something special. And I think they've done that. If you had all paid attention to your social media last week, some Trump supporters have been so outraged that they took to the airwaves to televise burning their Nike gear and even recommended folk buying Nike shoes that the liberals like and torturing them. The advertisement that you see is an uncomfortable close-up image of Kaepernick's face in black and white emblazoned with the phrase Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. The NFL has been incredibly transparent about its desire for Kaepernick and his message of racial injustice to go away. However, their attempt to silence his voice has only amplified his cultural power. Kaepernick often evokes, invokes the history and legacy of the radical black tradition from W.E.B. Du Bois to Angela Davis. And he has become the NFL's worst nightmare. But the truth of the matter is that Colin put his all on the line to speak for those who had no voice and he lost his career. Colin Kaepernick lived out the admonishment of the Apostle James to speak for the powerless and the oppressed. I believe that Colin is an example to all of us that faith without works is dead. In other words, the value of what we believe is tied to our willingness and ability to sacrifice for it. My word of challenge for us this morning is this proclamation from the book of Nike by way of Apostle Collin. <laughs> Believe in something even if it means sacrificing everything. Oh, the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Roman church also has a word for us would-be Kaepernicks on this homecoming Sunday on this UBE Alexander Crummel Social Justice Sunday. Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice 
holy and pleasing to God. Yes. This is your true and proper worship. Yes. There's a word for us here this morning. But I must warn you that it is a word of extreme challenge. I've come today with a word that is at once disturbing, distressing, disruptive, and depressing. This word that is mine to share with you comes from the life of Colin and from the stylus of a preacher named Paul. Uh, this distressing word was placed in a letter that was addressed to all that be at Rome, but for, for some strange reason, it seems to be a word that is addressed to your name and to my name as well. <clears throat> I have a word this morning that may cause you to be ill at ease with the practice of religion as you have come to know it. I have a word that may cause some questions about the focus of your faith and the content of your commitment. I have a word that may, may make you squirm in the padded pews of your brand of comfortable Christianity. I have a word this morning that may stop you in your tracks of pseudo-piety, presumptuous religiosity, and self-indulgent spirituality. I have a word. And so in all honesty, in all fairness, Perhaps you may want to leave <laughs> by the nearest exit right about now. Because I can assure you that I have a word that is at once disturbing, distressing, disruptive, and depressing. Now you may be disturbed to discover that whatever you have been doing as part of your Christian witness, it may not be enough. Whatever you have been doing as a testimony to your religious lifestyle, it is inadequate and insufficient. If today you are tired and worn out and stressed out because the church enterprise requires so much of your time and consume so much of your energy and because it saps so much of your creative and intellectual forces with seemingly little return, whatever it is that has you tired today, it is still not enough. There is something else that God wants. I know you do not want to hear this, but no matter how much you have given of time and talent and treasure, it is not enough. Whether you've been involved in the work of the church, it's not enough. There is something else that God wants. And you won't mind this morning if I tell you that it is of no consequence how long you have been part of the church on this your homecoming Sunday. You may count the years of your membership by decades and by scores, but you, your count really won't count. If you've been coming to the church Sunday after Sunday, year after year, week after week, and if the church door can't crack open without you walking in, still I must tell you that it's not enough. It is not enough. There's something else that God wants. Oh, beloved, I regret that I must be the bearer of bad news. But it is required that I tell you that even if you hold positions of leadership in the church, even if you have gained so much on the spiritual weight scale that uh, there are those who listen to your teaching and follow your direction, even if it's a proven fact that you have such high leadership skills that even you believe that the church can't function without you, Oh, it may be disruptive, but I need to tell you, it is not enough. There's something else that God wants. <clears throat> oh, I hope that I will remember to tell you this morning that this message, this word I have today may be disturbing and distressing and disruptive and depressing because I have the unfortunate assignment of telling you that even though you are a tithe, 
and you bring your tithes and offerings to the storehouse. And it took a while, but you finally decided to give God what already belonged to God. <laughs> Even though now you are a tither and, and you do give that 10%, and, and now you're just wanting, uh, waiting on the windows of heaven to open up and pour you out a blessing. It's not enough. I'm aware, and painfully so, that this is a difficult message, a difficult word. It's the word that we did not want to hear. Strange as it may seem, I must add to this misery by telling you that even when we gather to worship, whatever we do may not be enough. We come here for worship, we, we sing our songs, the, the anthem stirs our hearts, the gospel stirs our feet, but it's not enough. We are programmed by the same program to pray the same prayers and preach the same sermon and give the same dollar, but it is not enough. We even may say amen and lift up holy hands and clap our hands and sometimes even shout, but when it's all over, it's not enough. The problem is that typically our worship is designed for us to get what we want. But beloved, worship is not authentic worship until God gets what God wants. Whatever we are doing in the religious enterprise, whether our membership or leadership, our tithes or our worship, Somewhere in the process, God ought to get what God wants. Oh, I do not know how it has occurred, but somewhere in the process of the religious enterprise, we develop the notion that when we come to worship, we ought to get what we want. But God sees to it that you get what you want every day. With every breath you take, you get what you want. With every step you take, you get what you want. When the Lord puts a roof over your head, you get what you want. When the Lord puts food on your table, you get what you want. When the Lord puts clothes on your back, you get what you want. Even when you think you are deprived and when you think you are handicapped by some personal or physical or financial deficiency, it is still true that if you're able to say good morning, you've already got what you want. I want to raise is this. For all your coming and going to the church and around the church, for all your sitting and worship in church, I'd like to know when does God get what God wants? I hear folks saying all the time, you know, I went to church today and I didn't get anything out of it. Have you ever, beloved, considered that what goes on in church is not for you? <laughs> Worship is not a time to get. It's a time to give. Worship is not something that comes for you. It comes from you. Uh, whenever we gather in this place of worship, beloved, it's time for God to get something. God's got to get the glory. God's got to get the praise. God's got to get the honor. God is worshiped because God is worthy. And maybe instead of serving ourselves, maybe we ought to concentrate on serving God. Yeah. Maybe instead of singing what we want to hear, maybe we ought to sing something that God wants to hear. <laughs> oh, I'm convinced that no matter what we have been doing as part of our Christian witness, it is not enough because there is something else that God wants. If by chance, beloved, this word of the insufficiency and inadequacy of the contemporary religious enterprise has in any way been disturbing or distressing, perhaps you are able to imagine with me the force and effect which Paul's words had on those who were part of that first century church at Rome to which he wrote. But just consider 
if you will, their work and consider their witness. These were, were they who created a faith out of nothing. When the Greeks called it foolishness and the Jews called it a stumbling block. But to them, Paul says, it's not enough. These were they who joined the church when there was no church. These were they who were converted by uneducated evangelists who were convicted by illiterate and unlettered fishermen and who were led to Christ by the preaching of one who admitted that he was the last to see Jesus. But to them, Paul says, it's not enough. These were they who came to church when the only sign and symbol they had was an old rugged cross that served to remind them of an ignominious death on a blood-soaked hill outside the city walls of Jerusalem on a miserable day that somebody oxymoronically called Good Friday. But to them, Paul says, it is not enough. These were they who even when they read Paul's epistle could only be certain that soon and very soon they would be discovered in their catacomb sanctuary, in their secret hiding place of worship and then be led to their death in Nero's Colosseum. But to them, Paul says, it is not enough. It is not enough. There is something else that God wants. But tell me, what does God want now? If everything else is to no avail, what does God want now? If our membership has no substance, and if our leadership has no lasting effect, and if our tithes and our offerings cannot assure our redemption or our salvation, I'd like to know, what does God want now? It would be a tragedy to go through all of this work and worship and spend all of this time and give all this money and still not give back what God wants. What a tragedy to discover. After all your years of coming to church, after all your attempts at being religious in this life in order to gain a home in the afterlife, what a tragedy after struggling week after week just to get here. After all, after all of that, to discover that you still have not given what God wants. The question is pertinent and important. What does God want now? Well, Paul says it rather clearly. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now, now in the first instance, what God wants, I believe, are Christians who are more interested in expressing than they are in Impressing. Here's what I mean. Far too much of what we pass off for religion is designed to impress others about something about ourselves and not to express something about God or how God is working in our lives. But I tell you what, when you present your body, you're not trying to impress. When you cast aside self, when you decide to offer your flesh and your bone and your soul and your sinew, when you just lay yourself on the altar, when you lay yourself prostrate before God's throne, when you put yourself at God's disposal and mean it and make yourself available for God's use, you're not trying to impress. Uh, when you take a knee in life, even when it means you might lose it all. But Paul says, God doesn't need us to impress God. How can we impress God? After all, we were conceived in sin and shaped in iniquity. How will we impress God? We were not there when God laid the foundation of the world. We were not there when God called things that were not and made them into things that are. How will you impress God? Even our righteousness is but filthy rags in God's sight. Paul says, present your body. Yes, yes. That's an expression of commitment. Present your bodies. That's an expression of authentic faith and unquestioning trust. Present your bodies, not because you want to, but because 
because you have to present your body. Nobody can make you do it. You must be willing to do it. Present your body. Not because you want to, the world to see you, but because you want to see God. That's what God wants. Now let's look again at what Paul really says about what God wants. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. I believe perhaps the second thing that God wants is a living sacrifice. Uh, now you must understand that the Judaic sacrificial system was based on the concept that God could not be pleased without sacrifice. Uh, they brought the dove, they brought the lambs, they brought the goats, but just as soon as they got there, death took the sacrifice. What the Jews had was not a sacrifice that celebrated life, but a sacrifice that resulted in death. Uh, but I came this morning to tell you that God does not want a dead sacrifice. God wants a living sacrifice. Brother Isaiah understood that. Isaiah understood what God required and he wrote it down. He said, God said, I have had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. God wants something else. God cannot use a dead sacrifice. God wants a living sacrifice. God cannot use anything that is dead. In my 50 years, I discovered that a whole lot of folk in church, they're in church, but they're dead. <laughs> A whole lot of folk have names on the road, but they're dead. No zeal, no life, no enthusiasm, no fire, just dead. But God wants a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice says, use my hands and my feet. A living sacrifice says, here am I, Lord, send me. A living sacrifice says, I go where you want me to go. Oh, you know, black folks have always known what it is to be a living sacrifice. The society had determined that death would be our destiny, but through that experience, we learned to be a living sacrifice. Perhaps your mother didn't have uh, much, but she knew how to scrimp and save and make do with, with stuff. Uh, the leftovers would somehow uh, become a meal fit for a king. Love knows how to be a living sacrifice. Some mothers and fathers never went to school themselves. They never walked across the stage with diplomas or degrees, but they worked from sun up to sundown so that their children could have the things they never had. That's a living sacrifice. Yes. We are where we are today. The great grandchildren of enslaved Africans, those who came to these shores like cattle on slave ships through the Middle Passage and endured the ships. They endured the chains. They lived through the master's lash. They picked cotton from first light to dark in order that we could go to school and wear designer clothes and drive fancy cars. They suffered and bled to bring us. That's a living sacrifice. God wants us, beloved, to be a living sacrifice, to believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything, to back up our faith with works and sacrifice. And that's enough. Oh, that's enough. We have to be willing to sacrifice ourselves for the agenda of God. And the agenda of God has everything to do with the least of these. The agenda of God has everything to do with standing with the poor. The agenda of God means seeking and serving God in all persons and loving our neighbors as ourselves. The agenda of God means stepping outside of yourself to stand with someone you may not, uh, who may not smell or dress or speak like you. The agenda of God is to strive for justice and peace in the world. The agenda of God even is to stand with those who dare take a knee to protest racism and police brutality. For as my friend the Reverend Dr. Jonathan Walton has said, there is not a song beautiful enough that 
should make us ignore the blues of America's oppressed. Yes. Nor is there a flag big enough to cover up the nation's injustices. Amen. Oh, beloved, this morning, on this homecoming Sunday, on this UBE Social Justice Sunday, where we honor the memory of Saint Alexander Cromwell, I challenge each one of us this morning to not just sit in this place and worship and prayer and song, but to praise God with the unselfish giving of your whole self. That's what God wants now. That's an authentic, living sacrifice. That's praise in its highest and most glorious dimension, and that's enough. Oh, we ought to be able to sing like the songwriter, all to Jesus I surrender. All 